All right, we're live. I'm all staring at it. Like, <laughs> we're live, we're alive. It's not five. That's no job. <laughs> so just wait a few minutes. We'll get on in a second. All kinds of stuff popping up and I can't read it very well. Somebody's on. God bless you, love you. <laughs> I see a picture with people. Marty, God bless, brother. Give us a few minutes. Get your Bible. Get situated, get comfortable. We'll start here in a few minutes. I want to get some of you in. Uh, time to get on and get situated and get comfortable. But we'll get started. Love you, Marty. Love you, whoever else is on. I can't really tell. <laughs> Andrew, what's up, brother? Love you too, man. We'll get started in a minute, so don't go anywhere. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Give us a few minutes. Get your Bible handy. Get whatever you need to get comfortable, and we'll get started here. Victor, what's up, brother? I see your picture. I recognize that one, even from far away. We'll get started here in a minute, so just get comfortable in your car. <laughs> Find a good spot to park, and we'll get started. Get your Bible. Turn to Luke chapter eight. Good evening. Everyone says good evening, Victor. Victor said good evening. What's up, Victor? <laughs> What's up, Victor? <laughs> Yeah, see you on Sunday, Andrew. See you Sunday. Okay. Going out to lunch with him on Sunday. Looking forward to it. Raul. Oh, the Philippines is watching. Praise the Lord. We'll get... Oh, there's some people getting on. I have no idea who, but... Love you guys. God bless. We'll get started in a minute. Give us a few minutes. And we'll get started. Get your Bible handy open to Luke chapter 8. I think I need to get some water, so I'll be right back. guys we'll see your little picture on the thing anyways and see your name pop up <laughs> Andrew tell everyone we said hi we love you guys to everyone who's around you, we said hi. Raul, same to you, everyone who's with you, we say hi. <laughs> well, it looks like my mom. That's my mom. Hey, mom! <laughs> We're gonna get started here in a minute. We're gonna have some worship and then we'll get into the word. Give it just a couple more minutes.
<laughs> I want to go up to the phone and see who it is, but I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'll refrain. I'll, I'll hold back. My flesh is crying out to go up. Put my face right in the screen so I can see. <laughs> I think we can get started. Yeah? Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Like I said, we're going to have some worship, so let's just bow our heads. Let's pray. And we'll start to worship the Lord. Father, we come before you now with just hearts full of thankfulness and praise. And as we lift our voices, we lift our hands to you now, we ask that you would just receive it and that it would bless your heart, Father. We ask that it would just rise to you, a sweet-smelling aroma, Father. We worship you, we praise you now, because you are worthy. We ask that this time would just be anointed by you, and that it's all for you, Father. So be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord.
So we pour out. 
Praise God, praise God. That was amazing. Let's pray, Father, we uh, come before you now, and that's the cry of our heart. Great are you, Lord. And as we get into your word tonight, Father, we ask that you would bless this time, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit and speak to our hearts. Help us to understand these things we're going to look at in the Gospel of Luke. And better, help us to apply these things and live them out in our lives in such a way that people would look and glorify you. So, Father, we just ask that you would be with us now. Draw us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise God. That was good stuff. I love it. I love it. Welcome, everyone, online. Gabriel, what's up? Lillian, how you doing? Love you guys. God bless. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 8. We're going to pick up in verse 26. We're going to read through verse 29. Or 39. <laughs> Excuse me, 39. I looked at it like, whoa, we're only doing three verses. <laughs> No, 26 through 39. But before we get started, I always say, if you guys feel the Lord put it on your heart to share, I always say, share the page. It's one way that we can get the message of Jesus Christ out. Uh, there are numerous ways. You can share at work. You can share with your family. You can do all kinds of different things. This page is just one way. If you're online watching, I encourage you to share it. I always say, you never know who might tune in. It could be an enemy. It could be just a random person. It pops up on their screen. They click it. They hear the word of God and they're transformed. So I encourage you, if the Lord puts it on your heart and you've been blessed by the page, share it. It's another thing. I, I talked about it last week. I'll talk about it again briefly. The YouTube channel is for those who don't have social media. And there's plenty of people who don't. And there's nothing wrong with that. And if they don't, you can always encourage them to go to the YouTube channel. It's Friday Nights in the Bible. And they can see the studies there. Another thing, if you need the Word of God, I'll send you I'll send you one. Just give me your address and all your information. We'll send it free of charge. You just got to tell me where, where to send it and we'll send it. Um, what else? Sunday mornings. If you don't have a home fellowship and you're in the area or the city of Ontario... I have a study that you can go to. Dan Edwards, we're going through the book of Romans. It's amazing. We'd love to have you. If you don't have a home fellowship and you're looking for one, I'd encourage you. Hit me up. I'll give you all the information. We'd love to have you. Anything else? I think that's it. I think that's it. Let's, uh, let's get into the word. Like I said, Luke chapter 8. We're going to pick up in verse... 26 and let's read through verse 33 and we'll get into the study okay picking up in verse 26 dr. Luke writing then they sailed to the country of the Gadarenes which is opposite Galilee and when he stepped out on the land there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time and he wore no clothes nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound with chains and shackles, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many de demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountains, so they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the into the lake and drowned okay wow this is an interesting story we'll get into it let me let me see my intro really quick <laughs> and this is a really like you look at it this is really cool i mean for me as a kid this is stuff that 
And you're like, oh, and your eyes bugged out. And this was stuff you saw in movies and different things. So we're going to get into this. This is a really cool story. But remember with me last week, and I like to go back and just refresh some points that we covered last week. So when we get to this, we're going to understand everything a little better. So last week, when we were in verse 16, and Jesus gave the parable of the lamp, and he says no one lit a lamp to cover it, right? And we talked about it. That's pretty, fairly obvious. You don't light a, a light in the darkness and then just turn around and cover it. It's kind of it's kind of obvious. You light it so it can bring light to the room. It makes everything around obvious. It illuminates. It reveals. We talked about a lot of this stuff last week. And the question became last week, as we look back at this, are we shining and what are we doing with the light? Are we hiding it? Because a lot of times we have a tendency of doing that uh, for a numerous, for myriad amount of reasons. We can try or we do hide the light sometimes. And the question became, what are we doing with that light? It's on, are we hiding it? And then Jesus said, take heed how you hear. Him who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And we've been going over that. For whoever has, and then we said, has an open ear to hear. Has a heart of understanding. You want to understand. It's the attitude of the heart. And how are we listening? That's a big thing because sometimes we come and we don't really want to hear. We'll go, but we're not really hearing. We don't have an ear to hear. We don't want to understand. We don't want to go any further. So that's an important thing to understand when Jesus says, take heed how you hear. Are we coming with that open attitude, that open heart, saying, yes, Lord, I want to hear. What are you going to speak to me tonight? I want to hear your voice. Speak to me. Speak to me. That's the attitude we should have when we come to a Bible study. We come to hear the word of God. We need to come with ears to hear, with an attitude, an open heart to receive from the Lord. Because sometimes we come and we don't have that. We don't even care about it. Yeah, this is just another boring Bible study, been there, done that type thing, you know. And then we start to get self-righteous in a sense. And I know that. I've heard that one taught like, 10 times already by really renowned, well-known teachers type thing. What's our attitude when we come to hear when the Word of God is being presented? Do we want to hear from God? Or are we coming and closing our hearts right away? And then he goes on and he talks about 19 through 21. We looked at this, the spiritual family. The spirit is thicker than blood. Huh? What? Some family... They'd be like up in arms if you said that. There's nothing thicker than blood. And, you know, sadly, I have family that's like that, that thinks blood is the only thing that matters. And Jesus says, no, my family's not that. It's those who hear the word of God and do it. And that was an amazing statement. Everyone would have just like stepped back like, whoa. What did that man from Nazareth say now? He said another thing that shocked us. The spiritual family, the forever family, and I went, I went into it, and I won't again this week. But I look around, I see my brothers and my sisters, people I love dearly. It's a forever family. It's awesome, and we can't even begin to fathom how big our family really is. I have brothers and sisters. We all have brothers and sisters we've never known yet, and we won't know until we get to heaven. That's an amazing thing. I read about some of these examples that we have here just to think one day I'm going to be sitting with them. That's a really cool thing. And this is my family. The Apostle Paul, that's my family. The Lord. God. That's my father. That blows me away. And it makes me always think of 1 John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children just to understand and to, to try to wrap your mind around that. That God is my Father, that He loves me, that He's done all this, that Jesus died on a cross for me. Who 
doesn't want to be part of that family? It's just an amazing thing when you think about it. It, re it really is. I encourage you online, all of us here, meditate on the love of God. The love that God has for you individually. It's an amazing thing. Meditate on that. And then, we go over this a lot, but I always love it. He says, those who hear the word of God and do it. Does that describe us quickly? If you search your soul, you search your heart. Does this describe you, me, all of us? And then we got into the boat, <laughs> which this was really cool too, because you have this boat, 26 and a half, 27 feet long, seven feet wide. We've seen that Jesus went to sleep. The disciples, the apostles, a lot of them are professional fishermen. Peter, Andrew, James, John. Grew up on this body of water. Yeah, we got this, and they go out to the lake, and the storm comes. And we went over this, so I won't belabor this too much. The storm comes, and these fishermen all of a sudden don't know what to do. And now Jesus is asleep in the boat. Imagine the scene, how loud it was. The wind howling as it goes by, whipping the sail, whoosh, tossing that boat, <laughs> tossing the boat, just man. And I always think of Perfect Storm because that movie's like just crazy with the little boat going up the wave. And I was thinking earlier, <laughs> as I was thinking about it, when Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves and he says, peace be still and it's immediately calm. Imagine if they're like up on a wave, at the top of the wave, and Jesus says, peace be still, and it's just all, Boop! and it's like, ah! it's like Wiley e. Coyote, and the, and the cliff falls out from under him. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of that earlier, but I started laughing, so I thought I'd share it now. <laughs> but he rebukes the storm, and we, we pointed out, and there's so many lessons here, and we said it last week, it's a lesson for a thousand generations. He hears our cries. That's what woke up Jesus. That is so encouraging for all of us because we will all go through a storm. And we're all going to go through many storms. If the Lord should tarry and, and we're here still, we're all going to go through them. It's a given. That's a promise. It's comforting to know that he hears us. It's also comforting to know that Jesus is in that boat with us. He understands he loves you. If you're online watching and you're in a storm right now, take hold of that. He loves you and he hears you. He's right there with you. Remember he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. That's because I'm older. That's something you could say. The check will never bounce. Well, we don't write checks anymore. So if you're young, you're probably looking like, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> You can take it to the bank. He'll always be there. He's faithful even when we are faithless. He cannot deny himself, the Bible says. That's an awesome thing because I know how faithless I have been through the years. I'll never stand here pretending to be something I'm not. And to know he's right there, he's faithful, that's amazing. That is truly amazing. And so, now as we get into it, we're going to get into this, this demoniac in the tombs, in the Gadarenes, at the tombs. And this, you know, as I began this study this week, it's, it's interesting because I thought of, <laughs> I don't know why, this movie freaked me out when I was a kid, The Exorcist. <laughs> and oh man, I just, this, every time I read this story that pops up is, you know, where Linda Blair's like, excellent day for an exorcist. And her face is all like you know, all messed up and she's on the bed tied up. And I'm like, man, it, it, yeah, it's like burned into my brain because it shocked me when I was a kid. I think I was only like eight years old and it, it was on public television. And it was, oh, you know, one of those things where you want to watch it and you look and you get scared ah, and you change it real quick. And then you go back like 10 seconds later. <laughs> I don't know. I was eight years old and I was watching The Exorcist. <laughs> it was on TV. It's one of those things that's burned into my mind. And as I read this, and we read about this demon possession, I can't help but think of Linda Blair and the exorcist. So let's get into it. 
It says, country of the Gadarenes. This is on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, some people like to argue about the city. You know, they'll pull their hair out and we're, you know, hey, if you want to do that, more power to you. But <laughs> I don't see it. It says country of the Gadarenes, so we're going to go with what the word says here. It's interesting, too, because you can look these things up. I like to look it up um, just so I can get a, like a mental picture. You could find where they think this place is, and it looks like the place. They're, they found the tombs, and a little ways off, they find the edge of the cliff that leads down into the sea where the pigs would have. As we go into this, the swine would have flew off into the, into the ocean. So it's pretty interesting. You can Google it. You can look it up. It, it's pretty cool to look at. It gives you kind of a picture in your mind to see, oh, wow. That's the place where Jesus was and this all took place. So another thing about this place, this is a mixed area of Jews and Gentiles. This isn't just Jews. So we have a mixture here. Now remember that as we go through, I'm going to touch on these things as we go through. And it says a certain man who had demons. Now when you, when you read Mark, or Matthew in his gospel in chapter 8, 28, he tells us that there were actually two here, but we only see in Mark and Luke and Matthew for that matter. He says there's two, but then it keys in on this one. So Matthew tells us that there was actually two of them. And this made me think of another movie, <laughs> but not, no, and we were watching it earlier and I brought it up because the Lord brought it to my mind. I don't know why it's Sandlot. I love that movie, The Sandlot. Um, makes me... Reminisce about being a kid and playing baseball different places run down places, but we just played wherever we could play And When it says there's two Matthew tells us two I always think of the sandlot Timmy and Tommy We're like <laughs> You mean to tell me You went home and swiped a baseball That was signed by Babe Ruth And actually played with it and then you have little Tommy and actually played with it you're dead as a doornail, Smalls. You're dead as a doornail, Smalls. You know, he just mimics his brother a little bit. And I always, when I read this, the two, I don't know why I thought of this, where one's really taking charge and taking hold, and the other one's just kind of in the background. We don't know much about them, like Timmy and Tommy and Sandlot. I don't know why I thought of that, but I even was watching a little bit of it before I got on here. Just, it was funny to me. I love that movie. And like I said, we don't really know anything about the other one. It's interesting that there is two, but we only really have the one that we're going to take a look at so we have this picture Jesus the disciples probably still wet from the storm they come to the land they jump off and here comes this demoniac this maniac and his buddy come running down so you have this scene they just the storm just ended and they're getting the land they're probably wringing their their robe and their cloaks out and everything else that they're wearing and they're still wet and you got this guy and this buddy coming down so what do we know about this it says a certain man from the city who had demons we know for a long time um, either way if it was a short time it's still not a good situation but it says it's a long time and he wore no clothes and it said, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. So we know he's naked. We know he lives in the tombs. We know he has a buddy, but he doesn't say much. Matthew's account tells us he's exceedingly fierce. So much so, nobody can even go that way. Which means fierce, and means he's hard to deal with. Or he's difficult, is what the original language says. Or means with that word. And he was demon-possessed a long time. And it says he's bound in chains. So these are all things we know. This is the biggest picture we have of demon possession in the Bible. Um, it paints a really big picture for us. He's bound in chains. Mark 5 tells us he broke the chains. And he cut himself. He was crying out and he cut himself. So when you put all these different... The different Gospels together, you got one huge picture. And it says he cut himself in Mark 5, like I said. And then in 28, it says, When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him with a loud voice, said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? 
I beg you, do not torment me. So the first thing we see is, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Right away we notice that the demons recognize exactly who Jesus is. There's no explanation here. There's no need to get into apologetics for them and, and to explain who he is. They're not questioning that. They know exactly. They know exactly who he is. That's interesting because many people don't recognize Jesus for who he is now. But the demons, they sure do. And that always takes me to James 2.19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. That's an interesting thing, because you'll always run into people who say, yeah, I believe in God. Or, you know, I believe in God. Well, yeah, even the demons. Satan, he believes in God. He believes in the Word of God. He believes. So the question becomes, what's the difference then? If you say you believe, and the demons say they believe, because we just seen it right here, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, what have I to do with you? Please don't, don't torment me. Is that why you come? What's the difference between you and a demon if you're both saying you believe? Remember, it's not saving faith to believe in the existence of God, to acknowledge the facts. Because we see here that the demons believe those kind of things. What sets us apart? Obedience. The demons, Satan, don't obey. He does his own thing. We see that. We know that. I don't have to get into a long thing. We know that. So we see here that they believe in the existence of God and the deity of Christ. We see that. We see that. And like I said, what sets us apart? They don't do the word of God. And the question becomes, do we? Do you online? It's one thing to say. It's a whole nother thing to do. And that's where we need to be. The Bible says we need to be doers. Not hearers only. Deceiving who? Us. Ourselves. You're deceiving yourself if you're not a doer and thinking that you have a right relationship with God. Are we doers? And notice they also say, don't torment me. So this tells us they believe in future judgment. Ah, there's a lot of interesting things here. This story is really cool. And then it goes into and it says that he was driven into the wilderness there in verse 29 it says for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man for it often seized him and he was kept under guard bound with chains and shackles and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demon and to the wilderness so we see this man is also isolated isolated now imagine this man I said He's had demons for a long time. He's been driven out into the wilderness. He's naked. He's cutting himself. He's screaming. He's alone. He's alone. He's isolated. And as you thought, as you start to think of this man. Imagine, this was someone's child. This was someone's boy. Now you see him living in the tombs, naked, isolated, for a long time, in the wilderness. He didn't start like this. We don't know exactly what happened because the Bible does not tell us how this occurred. But he didn't start like this. He was somebody's little boy. And now he's isolated. Yelling, screaming, breaking chains. 
so fierce no one can even go by him. He's alone, naked, in the tombs, in the wilderness, and it says for a long time. So just imagine this man. I want you to have that picture in your mind. Now remember we talked about it. The area is mixed. We have this mixed area of Jews and Gentiles. And we're going to see it. We have unclean animals in the pigs. And you have clean animals with the lambs. If you have Jews, you're going to have lambs. And you have these unclean animals. You have an area that's mixed. Jews and Gentiles. So you have the worship of Yahweh, Jehovah. And you have the worship of the pantheon of different gods that the Greeks and the Romans had. Whatever's going on. And we know of a lot of the different ones, so I don't have to go into it, but you have the worship of the one true God, and then you have the worship of all the other things that the Greeks and the Romans, they would worship. So you have a mingling together here, so to speak. And remember, they were supposed to be separated to God. The Jews weren't supposed to mingle. If you read your Old Testament, you're going to see it. And you're going to see God's judgment handed down. Because they don't want to listen. We're not, they're not supposed to be mingling. They're God's people. The Jews were supposed to be separated. So it seems to me that somewhere along the way, he opened himself up somehow, some way. And saint got a foothold in his life. And you start to see this man. You start to see this man. How many of us have mingled? Or are mingling now? And things that we shouldn't be. called to live holy lives, separated. And I'm not saying that <laughs> we suddenly don't, we're no longer part of the world. That's not it. But when you start to mingle, you start to open yourself up, you're in for a world of hurt. And this, as we go through, and we look at this man, there's so many like us, so many like this man, who are bound in chains, bound in the bondage of some sin. And I thought of, we're familiar with the, the miracle at the wedding in Cana. Jesus turns water to wine, the first one, right? John chapter 2. You can read it later if you'd like. Anyways, just to refresh your memory, remember they run out? Jesus turns the water to wine and the manager of the wedding and the master of the wedding comes and says, hey, what's, what gives, man? This is the good stuff. The good stuff you put out first. When everybody's wasted, you give them the cheap stuff or the poison or whatever you want to call it. The bad stuff. When they're already all drunk. But you've saved the best for last. And that's God. He saved the best wine for last, for us. You think worship was great now? Wait till we get to heaven. He saved the best wine for last. You think you've seen God do some crazy stuff now? And work in your life? Wait till we get to heaven. You get to see something different. He saved the best for last. All our voices are going to sound awesome in heaven. <laughs> Maybe not so much here. He saved the best for last. What has Satan done? He's offered you the first, the pleasurable stuff. First. It's an interesting thing. Sin is pleasurable. Satan offers the pleasures first. He always will. He always will. He did that when he tempted Jesus. I'll give you this... All this is mine. I'll give it to you, Jesus. He'll just bow down. He offers pleasures first. Why? Because sin is pleasurable. 
Proverbs 9, 10, 9, 9, 17, excuse me, says, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Hebrews eleven twenty four 24, and 25 says this, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than, in, than to enjoy the, pla the passing pleasures of sin. I'm getting tongue-tied, sorry. <laughs> Choosing rather to suffer affliction, I want to read that last part, with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Sin is pleasurable, and the Bible warns us of sin. Notice the Bible, nowhere, you can't, you can search the Bible, and nowhere it's going to say, don't chew on roofing nails. Or carpet tacks. <laughs> Where does the Bible say that? It doesn't. Why? It's not pleasurable. We're not going to go do that anyways. The Bible warns us about sin. Why? Because it knows it's pleasurable. And guess what? The enemy knows that also. He knows that drinking and all that stuff is pleasurable. Sin offers that first. And it's like all the commercials you can see and you can watch on TV that make that stuff look so great. Everybody's got like six pack abs, muscles coming out of muscles. And you're like, what the? I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> like, where is that? <laughs> and yet, people go do it and we see it and it looks good, but it never shows you the end game. You never see the person dying cirrhosis of the liver you don't see those things the enemy doesn't tell you that he just says look oh this is gonna be good you're gonna enjoy yourself for a season and you're gonna reap what you sow we had a friend as I'm thinking now he was in his mid 30s heavy drinker Well, his liver failed. Early 30s. He had a transplant. And if any of you knows, it's not easy to get one. There's a huge waiting list and, and, and the, all kinds of things that go into it. A lot of people need different organs and, and different things. But he got one. Doctor says, don't drink again. Don't do it. And he had to take medication for the rest of his life so his body would not reject the liver. Because the body sees it as a foreign substance in your body, not yours, so it'll try to kill it. Anyways, he had to take medication. The doctor says, don't do it. Well, over time, he starts drinking again. Heavily again and kills that liver. Now the doc, now he needs another transplant. The doctors are like, nope. They didn't want to do it. And so we hadn't seen him in, in, in years. We get a call. She, my wife gets a call. She calls me at work. She says, you remember Chris? I'm like, yeah. He's dying. She's like, you want to go pray? Yeah, so let's go. So I go. Man, it's an image in my mind. And he's younger than me. And this was a couple years ago now. He's in his mid-30s. And to see what alcohol had done to him. And it was hard. Because I personally know him, so it was hard to pray. It really was. He died a few weeks later. I went and he couldn't even talk. He was bloated, turning yellow. It was just bad. He was just mumbling and it was just it was it was sad to see, and those are the things that the enemy does not tell you. Sin is pleasurable for a season. He makes it look so great and you jump at it. And he doesn't tell you the the havoc it's gonna wreck you and it will destroy you. And he knows that. And he knows that. That's why he does that. He wants to destroy you. And 
we were created in the image of God. And he wants to mar that and destroy it and make it look so ugly. He hates us. He hates that. Don't do it. Don't go that way. I've seen the destructive force of so many different things through my life. And through the things I've experienced. And I've seen some terrible, heinous things. Don't go that way. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. And so, we also saw that he's isolated. Loneliness is a huge thing, especially in this country. I just want to talk about it briefly. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but suicide is rampant in our culture. I see it all the time. I hear of it. People call me and tell me so-and-so's daughter committed suicide. How old? 11. It's heartbreaking. Loneliness, isolation, these are all things that the enemy wants. When you read your Bible, it says it's not good for man to be alone. First thing that we are told, it's not good. Isolation is not good, and loneliness is a terrible thing. A terrible thing. And we have this example of this man before us. Before us. We have a picture here of spiritual warfare. It's real. Sometimes, and I know Hollywood likes to play on it because a lot of people like to be scared or have that fear, whatever it is. And a lot of people, and it's dressed up, and you know, the devils look like just some red guy with a long tail and a pitchfork, and we've kind of dressed it up, and so a lot of people don't believe in those type of things, or they think it's just a bunch of fairy tales, or you know. Just a bunch of stories. No, spiritual warfare is very real. And we are looking on that. Looking at that now as we look at this man. That's why the Bible says, put on your armor. Take up your armor. Put it on. Which means it's not automatically you're born again. The armor just, woof, it just falls on you. You got to put it on. Why? That we may be able to stand the fiery darts are coming. Praise the Lord. I think they're going on up there. <laughs> Some spiritual warfare if you hear that. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we got the Jews and the Philistines up there battling it out in the Valley of Elah. <laughs> All right. So now let's move on. Jesus asked him in verse 30, saying, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss or the abuso. So, he says, what is your name? This is interesting too, because when you look at both of these in the Greek, these, this is singular right here. What is thy or what is your name? Name, singular, thy or your, singular. So, it seems to me, and we're going to get into this, Jesus is talking to the man here. Remember, he sees you. We saw that with the woman at name. He saw her. Remember, they're in the synagogue and all the Pharisees are looking because they know Jesus is going to see the man with the, the withered hand. And Jesus saw him. And he looks at this man who most have looked down upon or just said, put him over there. We don't want to deal with him. He's too crazy. And Jesus sees him and says, what is your name? This is interesting. So Jesus is talking to the man, not the demon. And we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this because we have the next part says, because the demon steps up and he says, Legion, because many demons had entered him. So, this verse here, and you see this play out. If you've ever watched any of those exorcist movies or movies with the priest and, and exorcism and, and demons, they're always trying to figure out the demon's name. What is your name, demon? Give it to me. And the demon's like, ah, the person's like, ah, ah, ah. You know, you get the holy water and it hits them and it's like, 
Sensaya! You know, type thing. <laughs> this is one of those verses that I think gets turned around. And I think also it's crept into the church and the enemies used it to you. Now people are saying, oh, you have a spirit of fornication. You have a spirit of this and there's a spirit of this and there's a spirit of that. And the enemy has used this and twisted this. I think Jesus, I believe Jesus is talking to the man, not the demon. And then you have the demon step forth and say, Legion. Um, and that's interesting because like I said, you'll have that. Oh, you have a spirit of drunkenness. And, oh, I, hold on, I gotta get my buddy the spirit of fornication so you can fornicate and be drunk. Like, really? Like, it just causes like confusion and chaos within the church because then you see all kinds of crazy things. Then you see where, like I said in the movies, what is your name, what is your name? Because in ancient culture, and they still think this to this day, they thought that by saying the demon's name, you take the power away from the demon. There was a lot of ancient beliefs going on right now at the time, even in the time that this is written. The Jewish exorcists of the time and the exorcists of the time would try to call out the demon's name, find out the name because they thought it zaps its power. I don't know how, but they think by saying its name, you take control of it. You have authority of it. So you have a lot of different things as we read this that are going on. So, obviously, we don't need their name. You don't need the demon's name. You don't see that anywhere else in the Bible. Um, if you guys are familiar with Paul and Silas, Acts chapter 16, right before we have the story of the Philippian jailer, right before they get thrown in, they're walking through the street and this lady's behind them. Oh, these are men of God, you know, behind Paul and Silas. And they're walking, you know, they could show you the way of salvation. These are true men of God. And the Bible says Paul gets really, like, annoyed. He gets real irritated, like, man, just shut up. And in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of here. You know, that's all it was. You don't see Paul turn around, hey, I need to know your name, demon. Tell me your name. You don't see that. You go further on, you have the seven sons of Sceva. You don't see them asking their name. They just try to cast out in the name of Jesus. Now, what, what does the demon say? Well, I know Jesus. I know Paul. <laughs> I don't know you. <laughs> and then he attacks it. Like when you read this, it's like a cool movie. Like, oh man. <laughs> and the demon's like, I don't know you guys. And he beats them up, right? He jumps on them. You never see anywhere that you need the name of the demon. Because at the time, like I said, the ancient belief you had Jewish exorcists, you know, incanting and doing different things, putting a, a ring at the nose and thinking they could take the demon out of the nose and calling on the name of Solomon and all kinds of different things. When you read it, you're like, oh man, it's like a movie. And then you understand where some of these Hollywood movies get some of their stuff. They're reading into this lore into all these things and you're like that's why and the enemy I think has used this to the great confusion of many and now you have all these it, there's if you really looked into it there's all kinds of things I could go for a long time but anyways he says legion now a legion for Rome is around 6,000 soldiers so I don't know if there's 6,000 demons but the point is there's a lot there's many many and then they say, don't send us to the abyss, the abuso. Where have we seen this? It's the same word in Revelation 9 that speaks of the bottomless pit, the abuso. Don't send us there. Like they know, like, I don't want to go there. That's, that's for the worst of the worst. Like for us, like there's prison. And then, you know, at the time... Don't send us to Pelican Bay. That's the worst of the. That's the abuso. That's the abuso. We don't want to go there. That, well, some people did, but that's another story for another day. <laughs> Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So they know judgment's coming. They don't want to go to this place. That's 
Jesus says, for the worst of the worst, we're not that bad. Don't send us there. I don't want to go there. 2 Peter 2, 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. So, don't send us to that bottomless pit. They're crying out. So this is the second time they've asked Jesus something. This is the second time you can say they prayed. No, no, please, please. I don't want to go to the Abuso. Don't send me there. They don't want to go there. Remember, Satan's going to be bound there for a thousand years during the millennium. So there's, this is really interesting. They're like, uh-uh, I don't want to go there. I know who's there. That's like the worst of the worst. Those are the guys in Genesis 6. I don't want to have nothing to do with those guys. Please, Jesus. They're going to turn on me in there. You know, it's going to be bad. I can go, I can say a lot of different things, but... So again, we see they understand the authority of Christ and eternal torment. They understand these things. So in turn, they actually have good theology, <laughs> which is interesting because they're demons. And then it says, 32, now we get into the swine. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that he would permit them to enter them, and he permitted them. Then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. So, this is an old corny joke, but it's the first time we have deviled ham. <laughs> Sorry, somebody may not have heard that before. <laughs> it's also, as you notice, this is interesting to me. The swine, they fly off the edge, they commit suicide or you could say suicide <laughs> <There's some kinds laughs> of and it's the first reported case of swine flu <laughs> sorry I couldn't help myself <laughs> I started looking at this I'm like oh these little crazy jokes but anyways so we have the swine the pigs the hogs you read Mark's account of this he says there are about 2,000 no that's a lot of pigs and notice they'd rather be in the pigs than the abuso. That tells me that bottomless pit is terrible. And remember when it's open, they're going to come out and wreak havoc. They're going to open it up. They're going to let them out. A whole bunch of people are going to die. I'd rather be a pig than in the abuso. That's interesting. Jesus says, okay. Again, we see that they understand the authority of Christ. And the pigs commit suicide. <laughs> They'd rather die than be demon-possessed. That's interesting, too. But, so we see all this happening. What a, Imagine what the disciples are thinking. This man's coming down in his buddy, and they're coming down screaming, you know, they're naked. That's just crazy. All right, you got a couple of naked dudes running at you, screaming at the top of their their voice. Like I would be like, what? The? Hey, I would like push Jesus to the front. You got this, Jesus. You, you know, and they're like scared behind him, and they're coming out. What do you have to do with us, Jesus, the Most High, Son of God? You know, type thing. Don't torment us. You come here to torment us, screaming. Just imagine this scene, and then the whole thing plays out, and Jesus says, "Go." They pray, they ask, hey, you know, send us into those pigs over there, those pigs. Go, and then you watch the pigs all just go off the cliff into the ocean, into the sea. Just commit suicide. 2,000. It's not like just a couple running and you're like, whoa, this just, you know, imagine that. This whole scene is just crazy. Crazy. And now it says, when those who fed them in verse 34 saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city. And in the country. Then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and noticed in his right mind. And they were afraid. Okay, so they see what happens. People are watching. And they see all this. Now they run. Oh, we gotta tell everybody. You know, let's go tell the, the city. Let's go tell everyone. And they come down almost like Frankenstein or something. We go tell the city, and now everyone comes. Oh, we're gonna get you now. 
and they're all coming back, right? They come back. We have a picture of them running, telling everybody, this guy, this man from Nazareth, you remember, you know, old Tom down there, demon-possessed Tom, or we're, we don't have a name, I'm just making up a name. He's down there, he's demon possessed. Remember, we left him down there, we tried to shackle him, he broke it, no one wants to go around him because he's so crazy, yeah? Well, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, came and he did this, this, and that. And the demons left, and then all the pigs, they ran off the side. What do you mean all the pigs ran off the side? And now you got all this mob coming, all these people coming. Because it says, then they went out in verse 35 out to see what had happened, and they find the man. So they come to see for themselves, and they find him sitting at the feet of Jesus. Notice, he's sitting, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. How long, because it said it's been a long time, how long has it been since anyone could say that about that man? That he's sitting, he's clothed, and he's in his right mind. Some of us can relate to this. Big time. Big time. And you'll hear it all the time. Yeah, I don't I don't know what happened, but I remember that guy. Because of that guy, I know God is real. And you see that. You see this man now sitting, clothed, in his right mind. And it said he was demon possessed for a long time. So imagine seeing that. And some of us have been in terrible ways. Ter I mean terrible. A lot of families have at least one. They're called the black sheep. <laughs> Where you know like, oh, that person's just no good. The family doesn't want him around. Nobody wants to hang out with him. He's bad for business, whatever. Jesus gets a hold of you and in an instant it's gone and you look like I remember you there's no way I know we have if we search our hearts and minds we ran into people like that I've seen people like no way wow wow what an awesome testimony this man is and we're going to see it as we move, move into this more so we can begin to start to close this out and like I said it's always interesting when you run into that person you haven't seen in a while and just they were running amok and you run into someone and they love the Lord and they're completely changed you're like praise the Lord hallelujah how many people have said that like I don't know God must be real because I remember you. I remember. And notice it says, he's sitting in his right mind. This is the best description you have of being in your right mind is when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus. There's no better description right here. This is amazing right here. This is one, highlight it, underscore it, draw little clouds and happy faces around it. This is one that I really love. There's no better description right here than being in your right mind when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus. And then it says in verse 36, they also who had seen it told them by what means he who had been demon possessed was healed. So they went to the city. They told him how it happened. And notice the response from the people. They're scared. They're not joyful. They're not happy for this person that they know. Obviously, he has family. Obviously, he has friends. Jesus is going to tell him to go tell them. They're not happy. <laughs> you think they'd be kind of happy. Like, yeah, if we can actually go down there and this guy's not going to attack us. We don't have to bind him anymore. We don't have to try to hold him down and put chains on him and then watch him break them and then we all run they're scared it says they're they're fearful the truth probably is that the, 
they're upset that the 2,000 fates went over and they lost a lot of money. They lost a lot of money. That's a lot of money. We don't understand it so much because we don't deal in pigs anymore. Like, I'll give you two pigs, you give me one goat. Type thing. We don't do that. <laughs> you know, so we kind of like 2,000 pigs, we're like, yeah, okay. That's a lot of money. And it went over the side. And you'll have people complaining and oh how can you do that those pigs you know and they're probably the ones you know I hate to say it you're eating bacon in the morning and, and then you're crying about the face getting killed hey, it doesn't make any sense to me but hey that's another story <laughs> so you would have to figure they're upset they lost all this the 2,000 pigs this man they've known is now sitting in his right mind and they're now full of joy. That is interesting to me. And that is just something that I can relate to on a personal level. And I think some of us can too. You get right with Christ. You're transformed. You realize you're a sinner. You ask for forgiveness. The burden of your sins have been lifted because Christ took it at the cross changed, you're transformed. You go start telling people about Christ. Your friends, your family, we're going to get into this because Jesus tells this man to do that. And they don't like it. And they're mad. And they're mad. And we're going to get into this, so let's move forward. It's kind of a weird thing, right? As you look at it, it's kind of a weird thing. Like, they're afraid not... I don't know, it's weird because I, I can remember people getting upset or just wanting me to drink still and, and to do things like and I was just weird because I didn't want to drink and do drugs anymore. Um, so you, people stop hanging out with you. All your would-be friends are now gone. It's a, it's a weird thing how that works. And I think me and my wife, we can relate to this too because the family is the same way. Where I'm not cool anymore. As you guys know, I like to laugh. I like to have a good time. I love to, to mess around, have fun. You know, my family knows it because I make fun of them all day and I laugh. So, <laughs> <laughs> but then when you don't want to do those things now, just, you're not funny anymore. Why don't you just drink with us? You used to be cool. Well, that's not cool seen what real cool is and it's not that it's not that and remember the pigs shouldn't have even been there we talked about that earlier there's a mingling here shouldn't be there Jews were this was unclean this is Jewish territory it's mixed with Gentiles the pigs really shouldn't be, been there it's forbidden in the law it's forbidden. And this always, as I read it, makes me think how many times, as they say, because they're going to say, and we look at it, depart from us. They just want Jesus to leave. Because it says the whole multitude in verse 37, surrounding, in the surrounding region of the Gadarenes, asked him to depart from them. So here we have the demons praying twice. Now we have the the multitude, the crowd, the city praying. And what are they asking? Jesus, leave. Just depart. Get out of here. It says, for they were seized with great fear. And then it says, and he got into the boat and returned. How many times do we want, do we not want Jesus around when we're doing things we shouldn't? When we're mingling. Oh, you know, I could just do a little coat. I don't want you around right now, Jesus. You don't need to be a part of this. And when you're doing something wrong, or when you're doing and messing with things that are forbidden, we have a tendency of saying, kick rocks, Jesus. I don't need you. Because you're bad for business. Let me tell you, let me tell you, if what you are doing The business that you are in and Jesus is bad for that business 
then that business is bad for you. Bottom line. Get out of it. Run. Flee. Like Potiphar's wife and Joseph. Flee. Get out of there. What are you doing? If Jesus is bad for that business, then that business is bad for you. You shouldn't be doing it. There's no if, ands, buts about it. Bottom line. Don't do it. A lot of times, we tend to get involved in some illicit thing, and we push Jesus out of our lives. Oh, man. And you end up like this man. <clears throat> Where you have no more shame. You're shameless. You're naked, as it were. And that sin now has bound you in chains. And you're in bondage. Jesus has set you free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We were once dead in our sins and trespasses, the Bible says. But no longer. But no longer. Don't be this person. Don't be this person. Because it happens all the time. People don't come to Christ because it's bad for business. Well, it's bad for you. And you choose your business over Christ. Such a terrible thing. And I've seen the error of that. I've participated in the error of that way of thinking. Very bad. Don't go that way. This isn't condemnation. This isn't coming down like that. So please, don't take it like that. This comes from someone who has fallen, who has done dumb things before. I've seen the error. I know. Been there, done that. Sad to say. Don't go that way. Don't. And then these last two verses says in 38, Now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away. So, now we have another fourth time. Now the man is praying. He's asking something. He besought. That's the fourth time we see that. Twice by the demons, once by the crowd, and now this man. And what does he ask? He asks, let me be with you. And what is Jesus? What's his response? No. No. Return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city and what great things Jesus had done for him. Mark tells us, he said, go to your friends. Here it says, Luke says, return to your own house. And he says, go tell of the great things. God has done, the great things that Jesus has done. Go to your own house. Go to your friends. Go to your old buddies. Tell them. Tell them. Go to your old neighborhood, the people you ran around with. The people that helped you go down this path that were there. Go tell them what great things God has done. That's his command from the Lord. He wants to go with Jesus. He says no. All the other times Jesus says okay. Here Jesus says no. I want you to go to your own house. What does this show us and what does this tell us as we close? Go to your family. This is where ministry starts. You get saved. A lot of times, and you'll hear it, I got saved, what'd you do? You went home, you told your mom, your dad, if you were young. If you were older, you told your wife. You went and told your family, hey, I gave my life to Christ. A lot of times I looked at you like, man, you're a weirdo. <laughs> What's wrong with you, man? They could tolerate you when you were on drugs, drinking, and now that you love Christ, it seems like they can't tolerate you any longer. 
which is still like I get it, but at the same time I'm still like I'm always shocked when that happens. Like, really? You cared about me that much? That you'd rather me be on drugs and drinking and ruining my life and throwing it down the toilet? And Jesus says, go tell. Ministry starts with your family. With your family. Go tell them. Go sing it on the mountaintop. I think we have a song about that. Go tell it on the mountain. You know. <laughs> I'm not going to get into it. You guys are like, oh, just be quiet. But remember, we're living epistles known and read by all men. Go tell. We're all sitting here with a testimony of what God has done. All of us. There's not a single person that is redeemed that cannot go and tell what God has done. Not one of us can sit here and say, ah, God hasn't done anything. Are you saved? Yes, I am. Well, you can go say what God has done. Go tell. The world needs to hear what God has done. We have a message. Go say it. Go preach it. Go speak it. Yell it. We're living in the last days. I don't want to freak you guys out. I'm not some guy who knows the exact date or anything like that. But our redemption draws near. And it's nearer today than it was yesterday. Be assured of that fact. Can Christ come tomorrow? Absolutely. Can he come in 10 years? Yeah. I don't know when. Time is short. We all have a limited amount of time. Use it wisely. Use it to further the kingdom of God. I don't know anybody. Yes, you do. I don't know how to speak. Ask God to give you wisdom. When he opens the door, step through in faith. You'll be amazed at what God can do and a man or a woman with a willing heart. Someone who just says, Lord, I want to serve you in any way I can. Let's catch fire in these last days and let's watch what God will do. Let's pray. Father, we are so moved by this story of this man that you set free so many thousands of years ago. And as we read it, it's so simple, Lord. You've said that you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You've made it so simple, Lord. If we will just come to you in faith and ask for forgiveness. Yet so many of us do not. We're like this crowd who push you away. We get lost in the pleasure of the sin. <sighs> May that not be any of us, Lord. May we not go those ways. And in these last days, Lord, with the world so dark and so chaotic and sin abounding everywhere, we know that grace abounds much more. So as we go and share, may we be full of grace, not looking down on people, not judging them, loving them, because you love us. So much so that you died for us. Such an amazing love. It's amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. So, Father, we pray that these words that we read and that we study would take root in our heart and bear much fruit for your kingdom. Be with us now. We desire to do whatever we can to let everyone we can know about you. So use us in a mighty way. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Fill us anew. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you guys. God bless. If you have any
prayer request, please let me know, or you can put it on the page in any comment section. We lift it up on Mondays. We'd love to lift it to the throne of grace on your behalf. I love you guys, and I'll see you next week.